Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> so I want to say, first of all, what a lot of fun I'm having here. So uh, I hope everybody shares that emotion. It's, it's tremendous fun being here with all people. Most of you, I think, are very good friends. of the One or two people I've never met before. But I hope that we're going to make good friends too. So I think this is a great tradition. I'm always excited before any origami convention, but it's the more people I know already, the better. And I feel that this is like a big family, and it's a great party. So thank you very much for sharing this very nice experience with me. So this is a... <sighs> this was actually... It's, maybe it's about two and a half years late, because this actually was a... I couldn't decide what to present at CFC1. So Elan suggested that I might like to talk about making hand-drawn dra hand diagrams, and I didn't really like the idea at the time, but it's taken me two and a half or three, three years, however many y how long it is since the last meeting, to actually think that it was actually quite a good idea. So here it is. So, oh, well, that's no good, is it? We don't want that. We want this. Well, why is it not doing that? Oh, it's the last one. That's why, idiot. <laughs> okay, here we go. Right, so why, why do I diagram by hand? And the simple reason is for exactly the same, or the same sort of reasons that I took up origami. When I was a child, uh, I started to fall when I was about four or five, and the big attraction for me was the fact that I, all I needed was paper and me. Uh, so I was always interested in crafts of all kinds, hand, hand, handicrafts, and... If I had lots of books on how to make things, but there was always a list. And I was always short of about 75% of the things that I needed. But that was never the case with origami because I always had paper. So, and this, for the same reason that when we, one of the first things we learned as small children is to draw. We're given crayons or paper and, and paper or a pencil or something, and you start to draw. It's... It's such a sort of simple activity. Same thing, we're given a sheet of paper. One of the things everybody does is they write on it or they fold it. So, but, so freehand uh, diagrams uh, need only paper, paper and a rubber. That's all we need, in, in a sense. And the, the, the other reason is I'm a bit of a dinosaur. I can't... I, I, I'm, I'm afraid I'm wedded to all this technology, but I don't understand maybe... 90% of what it can do, and I'm a bit frightened of learning, so I've never learnt how to actually make computer drawings. But it's certainly direct, we can quickly make a mark on the paper. The other, and the other big thing for me is it really expresses the personality of the artist, or whoever's making that drawing. It, show, it, it's, it immediately gives the handwriting, the personality of the individual. Somehow, for me, the, the the freehand drawings have a they, they have a, the ability to show the movement of the paper. And after all, origami means paper folding. It doesn't mean paper folded. It's it's at least as much about the actual process as the finished object. And finally, it, it oh, this, this, one of the other reasons is that it it seems to complete the the uh, creation process. And it's, if you make your own drawings, then it's, you've, done it, you've gone from the beginning to the end. I used to make lots of excuses why I didn't make drawings. And I, it was always because I was never sure when the, when the design was properly finished. But the, the real truth was, whatever method you use, it's a pain to make drawings. <laughs> nobody, re nobody really likes to do it. And I, I saw very... Uh, high-blown arguments for never even starting. But anyway, if you do want to start, uh, I, I'm not actually hoping that I'll, <laughs> I'll get too many uh, converts from this, but I hope you actually might be stimulated to try. But, I mean, it, it depends whether you're suited to it. And a pig really isn't best suited to be able to sing. I've heard, this is a nice analogy that I heard from a husband of a cousin of mine who happens to be a, quite a fine a portrait painter, and he also does some teaching. And one of the things he says, you shouldn't teach a, you shouldn't teach a pig to sing for two reasons. The pig doesn't like it, 
and neither does anybody else. <laughs> so here's some challenges. So people say, oh, I can't do that because I need some artistic skills. Well, the simple truth is, I think all of us here, this, this, this convention is for artists. We, we've already described ourselves as origami artists, so we're making aesthetic ju judgments more or less all the time. So we've already got some artistic skills. Um, the question is, I'm not, I'm not really sure whether it's quicker than making hand-drawn diagrams, than making computer drawings. I really don't know. I've not timed it because I don't know how to do the other one. But when I listened to the two presentations this morning about making computer drawings, I, I find myself slightly less inclined to learn. Um, one big snag that I've discovered recently is that um, I submitted drawings uh, for publication, and it was with the Tante Dan. I sent some stuff for their convention book and for their magazine that they produce, because it's quite a status to get your thing in, in Joas magazine, uh, Tante Dan magazine, or the, the convention book. But they said, well, we want to publish, but we, we can't use your, your hand drawings because... Uh, you know, th it doesn't work uh, with our, our system. So we, and in fact, they redrew them. They made very nice computer drawings from my originals. One of the snags I find also is that when I'm actually drawing the steps, I find that I, I try to maintain a constant scale but because I'm not actually measuring anything. I'm not cutting and paste anything, pasting anything. Each, each drawing is, is made separately. So step one is I don't copy it and adjust adjust it to make step two. I'm starting again from scratch. And I have a tendency to enlarge the successive steps. And I want to maintain a, 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 a unified uh, uh, proportion. Uh, you need to keep in practice. You need to do it regularly. I'm, and I confess I haven't done very much. So I, during the preparation of this presentation, I've actually done some drawings of my own. Another idea that you, you might want to consider if you if you're want to take this up is to go to a live class, go to a drawing class, l learn how to do classical uh, figure drawing because it's, a, it's an age-old tradition. It goes back to prehistoric times, doesn't it? People want to make marks on empty surfaces and that's what we're doing. And if the formal traditions of, of learning to draw in a classical context is, is really an exciting process. So I thought actually there's lots of good people who've gone before us, who've made a pretty good job of it. And I thought it might be quite fun if you'd involve yourself in actually taking part in a little quiz. So here are some examples. So which artists do you recognize? Uh, most of these are drawings made by the actual designer. Uh, and I'd like you to write down your answers. And I'll give you the answers immediately so that you know whether you're right or wrong. So get pencil and paper. And don't go to sleep. Don't be sponges. You've actually got to use some of your own brain power for a little while. So I hope you have fun. It's not competitive. I'm not going to ask you to exchange papers to get your neighbor to mark. So be honest. Don't shout your answers out. Write them down, and then I'll tell you the answers. And we'll see who is the super, super champion of diagram recognition. So you might recognize this gentleman here. This is Yoshizawa, the father of... Uh, origami in all respects, diagrams, creation, etc., etc. So here's number one. Very nice, I think. Some nice shading, some nice shadows, some nice uh, three-dimensional images. So and it's a bit of a... It, it, I think they're familiar with some people. Some Brits should know who this is. Any more time required? I'll give you the answer. If you, and those that know the answers, have they written them down? Blank space. It's Jeff Bynan. He was the creator of the, um, the, the spring into action. And sadly, he's no longer with us. This picture was taken when he was quite a young man. So we'll move on to number two. Anybody get that, by the way? Did any, you got it. Did anybody get number one? Hands up. Not a one, goodness me. So what about this one? Anybody know about this? Can you see it okay? 
I like that second line of drawings where it all goes three-dimensional. They're pretty sketchy, but I like them for being sketchy. Anybody know? You know? <laughs> so it is Mr. Fujimoto. And here he is. So people think of Fujimoto for the hydrangea and all these things, but he did a lot of very nice solids. And of course, the classic cube, which you saw in the previous uh, slide, is this wonderful movement where from step three to four uh, is where everything collapses into this miraculous three-dimensional shape. So one of the absolute classics. Number three. Ah, you're not supposed to shout out. You've got to write it down. <laughs> Do you, nobody heard that, did they? <laughs> so it is indeed David Darudas. So he's and sadly faded from the origami scene a little bit, but he is on Instagram if you search for David Darudas. And that's a picture I actually got from his Instagram. Number four, another boat or a banger. Bit controversial, this one, actually. Anybody know? Yeah, some people know. It's this gentleman. So it's a bit controversial because he is very much in England, persona non grata. He is actually in prison for misbehavior. <laughs> so he was a superstar in the 70s and 80s. He was on British television all the time. You couldn't get away with... Tommy kangaroo down, sport. Tommy kangaroo down. <laughs> Remember? It's Rolf Harris. He, so he was the artist of the very first Harbin book, which was Paper Magic. But he's in prison. This is easy. A nice easy one for you. <laughs> Got it? Written it down? P anybody not know? Not many people know. Not don't know. Toki Yen. If you knew him, he was a delightful chap. A, a, a wonderful rich guy to, to, to know. And his legacy lives on. Here's a naughty one. La Sphere. La Sphere. Fantastic three-dimensional drawing on the bottom right. All done by hand, and how beautiful that is. Okay, you may not like the garish colors, but the drawings are terrific. Shall I? Anybody got it? Anybody not quite sure? You've some, some French people nodding their heads. <laughs> it's Jean-Claude Correa, who is pretty well known for... Uh, he was the founder of the Mouvement Francais des Plus de Papier, and he was actually a very close friend of mine. He sadly died a few years ago. Um, but he looks at his classic French image, his face, his portrait. He couldn't be any no other nationality, could he? This is a knotty one. It's a catapult by Martin Wall, but it isn't. But the drawings aren't made by Martin Wall, and it was in 1982. He did a number of very nice drawings for BOS, and you probably won't get this one. Anybody know? Hands up if anybody knows. So his name was Cy Bates. We don't even know what he looked like. I don't think he ever came to any BOS meetings. But he did a number of these very nice drawings, very three-dimensional, very lively, almost cartoon uh, style. Here's a beauty. Here's a beauty. <laughs> I think some, uh, some of our Spanish friends know the solution to this. And it's Angol Morion. And we have to congratulate him because he's been a father for a second time. Congratulations, Angol. <laughs> <laughs> Super book, and I love this watercolor shading that he, uh, that he uses. Very beautiful. It shows a great, uh, gives tremendous feeling of depth and volume, and there isn't a straight line anywhere. And that's Mrs. Morion, in case you're worried. Here's a nice one. You know? Does anybody know the model? Who's, the, who's the, the author? That you, get a, you don't get a bonus point for it, but if you know the author as the actual designer. So the, the, the draftsman is Paul Jackson. 
I used to call him the wild man of British paper folding. Now he's moved to Israel. I think he's been tamed a little bit. <laughs> but he's a good pal and he's a very stimulating man. If you know Paul Jackson, he's a very stimulating man. He was a big help to me. I mean, we were, we were in a way contemporaries in the 60s, in the 70s uh, in, in England. Paul Jackson questions just about everything. Here's a nice one. Ooh. <laughs> Any ideas? It's him. <laughs> okay, next we go to this. This, should, this is easy peasy. Very easy, that one. Neil Elias. This is a nice drawing too. Nice and free, and full of volume. You know? Kuni Kasahara. And this picture is of particular significance because this is actually taken in Saragossa, here in Saragossa. And we went, uh, we were, came to the, an early meeting of the AEP, and it was 1992, I think. And a whole group of us went to this park where we could rent bicycles. And here is Kuni bicycling and, uh, and trying to avoid going into the fountain. He's still around. He has a website. He has a blog, which you can look at, uh, which is worth reading. It, Google Translate works kind of well on the, on the Kasahara blog. But if you need the, the link, I can give it you. Lilac by somebody. You know? Nice drawing. Bottom, bottom right, very three-dimensional, full of, full of liveliness, personality, etc. And it's Yara Yagi. Smiley face, and this picture was taken at CDO last year. Uh, sorry, two years ago. But 13, lucky for some. Any ideas? <coughs> no? Have a look at the top right. Then t look, turn your head upside down. Maybe that will give you a clue. It's him. It's him. Yoshizawa. So I managed to steal that from a, a DVD of a, of a TV program or a, a, a DVD of a of work of Yoshizawa. And there's a couple more pictures that I managed to, to grab. Here he is actually at work. You can prove that he's actually doing it. He's got a nice sharp pencil, and he's holding the model in a pair of tweezers. And this is a diagram of the cicada, which Robert Lang wrote ex extensively about in the magnificent Yoshizawa anthology that's been published recently. This is easy. The trouble is we don't know who the artist is. <laughs> but we at least we know the book, which is the Sanbatsuru from 1797. It's not the earliest, but I think it, nonetheless it's a very beautiful, lively drawing of the crane here. And the calligraphy is gorgeous anyway, isn't it? This one's a bit curious. Hmm. So this, it's German, possibly, possibly not. It's a flower. Any ideas? Any ideas at all? Nicely hand-drawn, bit of shading. <laughs> it's this woman on the... It wasn't me, it's my wife. She said, oh, you've got to put me in your presentation. <laughs> so she wants to be in on everything. This one? You know this one? Again, a great drawing. This is, I like the, the, in the center, the bottom, uh, the one in the center at the bottom here. Nice curly. Uh, this, this, this lines very show very clearly the, the form of the paper. I'm sorry, it's not a very good scan, so it's a bit grainy. And it's Herman. Okay, so anybody get more than? Ha can you just tot up your answers? Anybody get ten? Anybody get more than ten? Anybody get more than five? Oh, somebody got more than five. Well done. Congratulations. Oh, you're the stars. Anybody more than seven? Actually, it's a pretty poor effort. Oh, that's pretty good, Vivienne. I'll buy you a drink later on. <laughs> anyway, on with this. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm crashing on. Some drawing principles. So if you're about to embark on this technique, maybe it's useful to consider some classic uh, drawing principles. 
Now, I hope I'm not patronizing if you already know these, but some of these things are never occurred to me when I first started drawing, so it might be well worth considering. So things like proportion, negative spaces, foreshortening. This is where you look at a, when you're, when you're looking at a figure or a, from, the, from a curious point of view, the bit that's nearest to you seems pro disproportionately large. Perspective, things like the, we understand the basic rules of perspective, but it's very mathematical. Um, the things like the vanishing point, you probably know about this. This business, you see arti uh, artists holding up a pencil to measure a distance. It's quite a useful tool, even when you're making origami diagrams. And the other thing, a bit of a tip, you step back. So artists use brushes with long handles. And the reason is, you never see an artist holding a brush like this. You hold, he holds the brush like this. And the, the reason is he needs to stand back from what he's looking at. The, our tendency is to look, get very close. And, but an artist will step back. He ha the, the, ha the brush handles are long for a very good point, for a very good reason. So this is, this is a, a painting by Cornelis de Man, which shows the principle of, of the vanishing point and perspective. And the Dutch painters like these tiled floors and these, these rafters, which emphasize the perspective and the, the vanishing points. And you can find a lot of stuff, books and stuff on the internet about this, this technique. And you know, even the Renaissance artists were fascinated by the concept of perspective. And here, this shows you the, this business about foreshortening. If you're drawing a figure, one of the challenges is to see, you can see on the left-hand picture how big the hand looks in proportion to the rest of the, of the figure. So here we've got, this is the, the, the thumb and pencil measuring. What, this is a method for the artists use for checking that the drawing that they've made is actually proportionally in key with the actual subject. So we're in, here we're talking, I should mention this earlier on, we're, we're talking about drawing from observation. We're, we're talking about trying to represent a three-dimensional object on a flat piece of paper. And that's what drawing is all about. And to prove that you're, 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 if, you're, if you're drawing simply by eye, from time to time you need to check. And this method is the way that, 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 that artists do it. And very often... We, if you're drawing a figure or an animal, you can see that it's, they measure how many head lengths the body is. And you can check that by using this, this pencil and, and a fingertip uh, method. I actually use it to make sure that my successive step drawings are the same scale, because I have a tendency, as I said earlier, to enlarge when I'm drawing without measuring stuff that the next, the, the, the drawings enlarge, and it's a nuisance. This is a great concept, negative space. So it's, from childhood, we're trained to look at the positive thing in front of us. And we, we, if we're drawing a bottle, for example, we, we, we want to draw the outline of it. But if we're making a drawing, it's a, we're, we're actually making a composition which is formed of lots of shapes. And they can be positive shapes of the shape of the bottle, or they can be shapes, in the case of these chairs, of the spaces between the things which make up. And you could actually, there are exercises when you're learning to draw, um, of making the thing, concentrating only on the negative shapes. And it's a great concept. It never occurred to me, this, but it's such a great idea. When you're drawing, you have to be as aware of the negative spaces as you are of the positive form of the object that you're, that you're trying to represent. So keep it in mind. And the very first time I went to evening classes to study drawing, I was given a plant, like the one on the extreme right, which had holes in it. And he said, David, draw this, but look at the shape. Look at the sh shape of the holes. Draw those. Be, be as, as much aware of the negative spaces as the positive ones of the actual form that you're that you're. Uh, uh, trying to describe, and it's a fascinating concept. And if you're if you're a painter or you're drawing, it's something that we, you tend to forget because we, from childhood we are trained to look at the actual object 
not the spaces around it. And some of the spaces that you see, they make very beautiful shapes. Even though it's a totally abstract shape, they can be very fascinating. Look at the, the shape at the top right of the chair painting, this curious form there. They, there can be beauty in even those abstract shapes. This is helpful if you're drawing with on a drawing board like this, keep it at right angles to your line of sight. Obviously, if you're, if you're trying to draw on, a, on a, a, a drawing board which is flat on the table, you're going to end up with a distorted drawing because you're looking, what you see is there, and if you tr transfer that image onto the flat page, there's much more chance of it being distorted than if the drawing board is at right angles to your line of sight. <clears throat> that's what that's supposed to show. And this is, a, this is a, extracted from a, a drawing book that I've got called Figure Drawing. Draw what you see, not what you know. We're drawing from observation. Now, in this case, he says the objective observation tells us that the hands in, the, in this drawing of the nude are very close to the right foot. But in fact, there's a considerable spatial distance between them. And it's because we know this that we tend to modify what we see to, what we to fall in with what we know. So for the novice life drawer, they would make a big space because they know that there's really a big distance between the hand and the foot. So this, now let's get down to the practical steps of actually making uh, folding diagrams. So the first thing, it's pretty obvious to anybody who's starting to make any instructional drawings, that you have to know what the method is. You've established the folding method. Now, the, when, we, when we actually fold, when we're actually created something, we probably do it in a way which is not very easy to, to describe, to, to, to actually draw. So you need to refine, you need to be sure that you can actually easily and compactly uh, uh, obtain the result that, that which will show effectively to the folder that you, what you can get, that, that he's going to get a good result. So have a, make sure that you know the method. Uh, it's helpful to have good light, and I think it's, good, it's useful to have a, a slanting light, not a direct light, so that you can see shadows. Because sometimes if it's a white sheet on a white background, you can't see where the edges are. Um, find some kind of a support to put the model on and leave it there. I mean, what seems pretty obvious, really, but if you move the thing around, how are you going to represent it? It's going to change every time. So you need to, le if you're drawing a step, keep it in that one position and keep your head in the same position, too. If you're, if you're actually making the mark, you've got to have the same viewpoint. Good paper, pretty obvious. Uh, I, I actually dislike step drawings one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I think it's pretty boring. So I like my flow of diagrams to be, uh, to be, if you like, artistic. It needs to have a sort of uh, uh, an interesting progression. I never use a ruler because I like, we're human beings, we're not machines. And even any piece of paper, it might look that it's got a straight line, but it look, it's much, got much more personality if it isn't, you know, crisply drawn with a, a ruler. And I, I dislike to use a photo to make 3D steps, I, because I think it's, in some ways it's quite good fun to try and make a three-dimensional representation of a, an object. I'm not saying it's easy. So these are the primitive uh, tools that I use. So this is a piece of, I don't know, some sort of board, a couple of clothes pegs, and my sheet on there. I've got these, this, this support thing, this stand thing you can get from Nicholas Terry's shop. Pretty cheap, but if you if you if you've got a three-dimensional model like this, it's, it won't stand up unless you unless it's supported by something or it's got a clip. So this is showing the the sequence, and you can see that it doesn't. In my drawings, it doesn't go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So the thing is going to flow around. It's going to go in a sort of a, a, a gentle curve, and I don't want every every successive page uh, to follow the same pattern. Um, and it's important, I think, not only to look at the page you're doing, but what the 
what's coming ahead. So the flow needs to be not just on the page that you're working on, but on the next one too, so that the thing flows logically. Especially if you're preparing for a book, uh, you prob the, the pages will be opposite one another, and you'll want the flow to carry on the, con the, the flow to carry on in a logical uh, line. So the final page there, I made extra drawings of the final step because I usually spend a lot of time making the final drawing because and very often the first one isn't the best. So I have a couple of two or three stabs at the final drawing. And you might be able to see some sort of constructional lines. So I've been trying to be aware of the perspective. So while you're doing that was before, this is during. So you, I use a, a simple pencil, HB to 2B, not too hard. I make corrections with a rubber or an eraser, if you prefer that word. I keep my head and the subject positions absolutely constant. If you're moving it around, then of course you're not going to get an accurate drawing. I make sure the drawing surface is perpendicular to my line of sight. And I, hinted, I mentioned this this morning. So at the beginning, I'm, the, the, you, you need to get the overall shape down first before you concentrate on the detail, even on step drawings. The, th the most important thing is the, the, the main form, the main shape of the, the step, and then you can get into the, the finer detail when it's clearly established. But don't start with the detail. Anyway, that's not my method. I prefer to get the, ba the basic form correct and then go into the fine detail. Spend a lot of time with the final drawing. This is the next bit is using cross hatching. You saw on Herman's curler unit, he put little curved things to show the shape of the of the curler, the curled flap. So this is another way of showing three dimensional form with line, shadow and toilet mat. So this, if you, this in the in the sort of these these pictures of these birds here, you can see the, that there's a cast shadow, and somebody. Uh, in the early days with BOS, somebody made some drawings and his wife said, what's that curious thing there? It looks like a toilet mat. It looks like the thing that used to go around the, the loo, you know. <laughs> I said, what's that? Is it a toilet mat? And it's actually the shadow of the model. So I, I always call it now the toilet mat. As I said, I dislike ribbons of tone because I think that I don't like these sort of bands of tone that snake around, which are supposed to show you which. You don't need that. We've got, we can see with our eyes that where the next drawing is. I, I've never quite seen the, the need for f ribbons of tone. Because the page composition, the numbers, the step numbers, tell you what, what, where, where we're going next. So after you've done that, these, are my, these were my first, these are the finished pencil drawings that I've made on my, with my primitive drawing equipment. In fact, I didn't use the final page there because I was actually fairly happy in the end result with the final drawing on the second page. This is a, incidentally, this is a model that I've had lying around for ages that I created at least 20 years ago. But it, when I looked at it again, it wasn't too bad. And I thought because I'd not done any drawing for ages and I was supposed to be talking about making hand drawings, I thought I actually ought to do some. So this shows, this was one of my attempts at, at a toilet mat. You can see the toilet mat in the front. And this is some of the cross-hatching. I think, I think actually I've overdone the cross-hatching a bit on the chest. But the, the, my aim really was to, to, to try and suggest some, some three-dimensional form, with, simply with line, without, without putting tone on it. So afterwards, what happens next? So I have, I think this is where I have to use my computer. I'm afraid I'm shooting myself squarely in both feet simultaneously. I'm actually going to use the computer. So I scan it in, in order to, uh, to, to, to do the work. Oh, before that though, I use a light box, which was actually Astrid's. I didn't use it at all before, but she had a light box with which to ink in the pencil drawings. So I don't ink in on the actual pencil drawings that I've made. I put, you'll see it in the next picture. I think here we are, here, here am I in action. This is a light box. So I put in the original pencil drawing and another sheet of white paper on top and I simply trace the drawing. And the purposes of this, if you make a mistake, you've still got the original pencil drawings that you've made and you can have another stab at it. 
but it's actually quite, it's quite easy to do. One of the things is that in this process, obviously we're relying on inking in fairly accurately. I use a fine line of pen. And one of the things is that I have to rehearse that inking in line before I actually do it, because otherwise they tend to be wiggles. You know, I'm not using any mechanical implements. I'm relying on simply my hand. Uh, then I add numbers, having uh, uh, scanned it in in Photoshop. I add text, and then making final refinements. So, so here we've got the things now inked in and coloured using Photoshop. And these two on the right were the final two drawings that I made, which I actually didn't use. And then we get to the, the, f the final complete drawings with every, all the text there. And you, very lucky you've got a QR code. If you want to have a go, you've got your own to have a go at home. Or you can use that, the, um, that link if you prefer. But have a go with the... The QR code. This is a, to a toy, actually, the QR code. I've only just discovered these things. They're quite useful. But As Asya's just finished her book about knitting, and she's made lots of little videos which explain some of the process. And she didn't know how she could get, how she could convey the information about the online videos. And somebody said, well, why not use QR codes? And so she made a final re revision of the book using all these QR codes. And now the book is published. She gets all these messages from people who complain, oh, I haven't got a smartphone. <laughs> and so it's, we say, well, no, if you, if you want to make a fried egg, you actually need a frying pan, don't you? But anyway. So and so I've really more or less finished. This is the you know the backbones of the the method. So this is a building that you might recognise. Anybody know what this building is? Carnegie Hall, correct. Why on earth am I showing a, a picture of Carnegie Hall? And the reason is because there's a, an iconic story about a of a, a concert violinist who was rushing home to get his train away from Carnegie Hall, from having given his performance. And he was stopped by a man in the street. I forget the name of the violinist. And the man said, excuse me, do you know the way to Carne Carnegie Hall? And you, you, I imagine you know his answer. Do you know how to get there? He said, practice, <laughs> practice, <laughs> practice. <laughs> and it really, actually, I've practice does make perfect, and I've actually, having not done any drawing for quite a lot of time, I, uh, I, I find that it, you know, it's something that we all put off, but it's a bit like going to the dentist. You think it's going to be awful, and it's not really great fun, but it's never as bad as you think it's going to be. So, any, so anyway, that's more or less it. So any questions, please? Yes, Michael. I just have two two things. Um, the first is when you were talking about the the ribbon and the flow. Yeah. And that structure, it's it's. I personally don't like it, mainly because these days most books are transmitted in PDF format. So they're vertical. And when you hit the bottom step of one, it begins at the top. And then on the next page, it begins at the bottom. So you just have to like really orient yourself mm. with it. So I find that kind of annoying in that, yes, books are still popular, but we are in a digital age. So I mm. feel like most diagrams these days, even if you do provide a book, there are going to be a certain number of people who are only going to have the, the, the digital version of it. So the, just for in general, when you're thinking about diagramming, that's something to think about. And the other thing I was going to mention is when I've tried to draw diagrams and I need to keep it in a particular position, a lot of times you have flaps that will move and you need to hold them down in order to be able to see what to draw. Mm. I will use magnets and metal tucked inside the model to just mm -hmm. simply hold it together. But thank you very much. That's a great, great uh, presentation. Thank you. So what I actually do, I make a difference if it's going to be published in like uh, 
magazine or something, or if it's going to publish as a PDF, because I make different versions. So if I do a PDF version, I actually make sure the flow goes all the way down through the pages. So I make sometimes two versions of the same diagram to make sure it's going to be displayed for whatever format I'm going to plan to publish it. <laughs> I have a little question about your here. Sorry, I can't see. Yeah, please, I'm sorry. Um, so why do you do the, uh, the layout, the flow directly in the pencil drawing? You could also do it when you're tracing it or even in Photoshop. I could, but I'd prefer not. I think this is, I mean, in the, it, ha it harks back to my, when I wrote my book, Brilliant Origami, I didn't have the luxury of a, a light box, so I actually inked in directly over my pencil drawings. Uh, uh, and I, of course I could, but it, you know, in, in the days of when I was making Brilliant Origami more than 25 years ago, I didn't have Photoshop. I, I did, all the drawings were made by hand and they were sent in the post to the publisher in Japan. But nowadays, yeah, I could, but I, w you know, I don't want to use this computer too much, I suppose that's what I'm saying, because it all goes back. I get uncomfortable in the, or in the origami world. Here we have the simplest conceivable raw material but people want to paint the bloody stuff and put glue on it it goes against all my <laughs> in my innermost chromosomes it really does I can't do it you know this it's just simple what are we doing with a piece of paper and we're folding it we don't need all this other stuff so for the same reason I don't really want to use the computer more than I absolutely must does that answer the question sure <laughs> Any more questions, please? So, so you said you did the coloring in Photoshop. I do. So I do. Why don't you do it on paper? Is it just I could, I could, but it looks a bit better. I've tried. In fact, Asya made some very nice drawings using a, a, um, a fiber tip, you know, color pen thing, you know, like a highlighter, and they came out pretty well. And again, they look. Or I could do it an angular way with watercolor, but you know, it's just. I'm afraid I've, you know, my dinosaurism, I'm, I'm becoming a little bit less extinct. <laughs> <laughs> and so when you're inking in, are you actually using different widths of yeah, pens I sometimes? Yeah, I've yeah. Got, I think I use 0.3 and 0.5. But I think the, I, mainly I use 0.5 millimeters, uh, fine liner. The only time I use a, a finer gauge is if I'm using existing creases. And when I'm putting existing creases, I want those to be less obvious. So I do use different grades, yeah. Any more for any more? Or have I solved all of your Brillustrator problems? <laughs> you mentioned that um, the Tent Hayden said they couldn't publish the dog. Your hand drawn down for yeah. some reason. What do you know the reason? <laughs> I don't really. I just think maybe it was Yamaguchi being just <laughs> a little bit difficult. <laughs> like no, but I think they they wanted to be able to manipulate the individual steps. I think, and they just thought, no, we don't want this. They do, yeah. yeah but actually, they, they within they sent off my hand drawn. They were t in fact, I was very lucky last year. I had one drawing in. The, the convention book and another in Joas magazine, and uh, uh, in both cases I submitted hand-drawn diagrams and they remade them absolutely superb uh, computer drawings and they were better than mine. I'll be honest, you know, they showed the method better than mine. I mean, mine are a, a bit edited. People struggle with my drawings. Jamie Kelly, I don't know if you know Jamie Kelly. He's always, he says, what's this crap you're giving me? I can't understand any of it. <laughs> so it's tough. It's the best I can do. It's not perfect, but it's the best I can do. No, do you use ink pens or fibers? I, I forget. In fact, they're Asya's. I never remember what. She's got a whole collection. I said, can you just let me have some of your... I think they're fine liners. Steitler, is it, is one of the brands... I can't remember, them. but they, they're just they're fairly cheap. I did used to use, use uh, for Brilliant Origami, I used some, what do they call them? Oh, Christ. It wasn't, it was, a, it was more like a fountain pen, but it was, 
uh, I can't remember, I've still got them somewhere, but I never use them because the ink all gets dried up inside and it usually the ink goes where I don't want to. Oh, incidentally, on, in, in a on a slightly related topic, I, the reason I'm, uh, I, we talked about purism and not wanting to add tools, and one of the main reasons for me, if you use a, a paint or glue and you make a mistake, you've got to start all over again, haven't you? Now, with it, if you make a mistake, if you put a fold in the wrong place, it's not really a big effort to undo it and make it correctly. Okay, you can't do it too many times, but for me, the big objection to using outside influences that they spoil. Okay, we can we can make all kinds of high blown arguments about where it destroys the purity of the square not to cut, but if you make a cut and it's in the wrong place, well, you've got to start all over again. I mean, it's pretty simple, isn't it? I'm 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 a dinosaur. Sorry. <laughs> Please. Uh, so Any more? Yeah. yeah. Um, so excuse me. I, uh, Sorry. Uh, sure. I got the mic. <laughs> um, um, we, you have uh, shown how you how you draw for uh, as the as the final diagram uh -huh. for, for publication. But for when finding the final uh, the, the final sequence the the folding sequence and to have a, an idea of how how many steps we will have how you will do it, you are you also take some sketches uh, drawing or not with really with another technique. Not or really. I, it's just rule of you thumb. You just I, start I just drawing. start and I keep going until I've finished. Okay. And the, the problem is that I I'm not sufficiently well uh, uh, organized to. Uh, to make sure that I get all the right steps on the page. And so quite often I, I find that I'm getting towards the end of one page and it's the last drawing anyway. Mm. So it, I have to sort of cram everything <laughs> in the bottom right-hand corner. Okay. But, but, you know, in, in that case, I'd probably... Uh, might, I might sort of cut and paste in Photoshop and make an extra, an okay. extra page or maybe shift around the layout a bit. But I just keep going until it's finished. Sorry, uh, wait, wait check. <laughs> What were you saying? If you make a cut in the wrong place, uh -huh. you can always use a glue. <laughs> of course we can. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Any more? So I think we're probably about just about on time. That's a miracle. It's never happened to me before. They did. So thank you very much for everybody. Thank you.